There's a river flowing from the throne of God. Drink from the water right now. Oh, there's a river flowing from the throne of God. Drink from the water right now. It's a river. Well, how many of y'all brought your Bibles this morning? You ready for the good word? Well, I'm going to preach to you what I preached last Sunday in the early service. But then there was a takeover. It was a Holy Ghost takeover. Now, the Holy Ghost was in the first service. But then there was a Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost movement in the second service. Amen. Pastor Francis did a wonderful job just being sensitive to the Spirit of God. It was her birthday. So the Lord says, do whatever you want. Amen. And, uh, and we, we, but that's not the only time the Holy Ghost moves. We know that. We're always interruptible here at Faith Alive, always keeping a freedom for the Spirit. But um, anyway, last Sunday morning, early service, I preached a message and I titled it, the contrast between law and grace. We need to understand that there are marked contrasts between uh, the law, the law of Moses, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, I want to go to one of our foundational verses. I've been teaching you on what I call this series, the grace life. Say grace life. And if you want to live a great life, I believe, as a Christian in this life, then you're going to have to understand the grace life. Amen? Grace and faith go together like water and wet. You need to know that. Amen? Can you separate wet from water? No. Or water from wet? No. Grace and faith go together. Amen? And so the Bible says, for by grace are we saved through what? Faith. And not of what? Works, lest any man should boast. Amen. We, there is no boasting. That's one of the things about the law and we're going to look at, it, that where is boasting? There is none where the law is concerned. The law actually reveals and exposes the sinful nature of humanity, bringing man to a point of having to cry out to God to save him. Amen. Law is performance-based. It's a performance-based relationship with God. God didn't call you to perform your way into his presence. Amen. He made a way through Jesus Christ and him alone. So looking again at at, at John chapter 1, and we're going to pick up in the 14th verse, John 1 and verse 14 as the foundational text. Looking, verse 14, it says, "And And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's He talking about there? He's talking about Jesus. Isn't that right? And John bore witness of him, of Jesus, and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and what does it say? And grace for grace. Let's read verse 17 together. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but, but, again, the word but is a line of demarcation and separation between the law of Moses and the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. Grace and truth was not being added to the law. God was just drawing a line of separation between the two. I liken it to a relay race. As Moses is running and all of a sudden Jesus is the final leg of the race. He's the one who called the race to begin with. But he finishes the race. That's why the Bible calls him the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. He finished the race. He got the trophy. He came into ownership of it all. He fulfilled all the law and the prophets himself. And when he did that, he owned it for humanity. 
And when he took ownership of it, it was for him to do what he wanted to do with it. And what did he do with it according to Colossians chapter 2? Having nailed the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, the law and the commandments, having nailed it to the cross. Amen. The Bible says he put the devil to an open shame, disarming the principalities and power. They had nothing over us or on us any longer. Amen. And so having said that, I want you to go with me also now to uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to spend uh, much of our time this morning in the book of Romans because it's the Pauline revelation and it is a Truly a revelation of the grace and law contrast. Say contrast. Amen. So Romans chapter 3. Look what he says here in verse 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, if we stopped right there, we'd start feeling pretty bad, wouldn't we? But what does it say after that? Look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law, I call it the law of works, is the knowledge of sin. The law causes sin to come forth. The Bible says the strength of sin is the law. Many folks want to continue in the Ten Commandments in the law. But the Bible says this, if you choose to do that, you are obligated to fulfill all of it perfectly throughout your entire life not missing one commandment at one moment because if you fail in one, you fail in all of it. And nobody was ever able to do that. Only Jesus was able to fulfill it. So who, why did he do it? He did it for us on our behalf. He is the son of man and he completed it all for us. Praise God so that we could be free. Let's read some more. Verse 21, this is so good. Let's read this together for sure. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Look at that. How many of y'all believe? That means that you are righteous totally by faith through grace and not by works. Isn't that wonderful? So verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being, let's read verse 24 together. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Freely. That means you don't do anything. You just receive from him what he has done for you. Amen. So notice he says we're justified freely by what? By grace. Say, I am, I am justified, justified freely, freely by, grace. by grace. Grace is unearned undeserved, unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to gain it. It's a free gift from God. Isn't that wonderful? Come on now. Now I want you to go over to Romans chapter 5. Having said that, I want you to keep that in mind, that you're justified freely by what? By grace. Hallelujah. So Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Now let's read that together. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wait a minute now. I thought we were justified freely by His grace. Now He's saying we're justified freely by faith. That's why I just said, you cannot separate grace from faith. If you understand the grace of God, listen, your faith will work mightily. Amen. 
Do you understand? I believe a lot of people have an understanding of the concepts of faith, but they don't receive the full benefits of faith because they don't understand or have not been steeped in the grace of God and understanding the grace of God. And therefore, they mix their faith and, and works. And there's a mixture, and it's by grace we're saved, not by what? Works. So if you understand fully what, what the grace of God and what it means to be saved by grace, your faith will work mightily for you. Notice he first said this, for by grace we have been freely justified. Then after that he says, well, by faith we've been justified. Hello, I'll tell you what, if you understand grace, your faith will soar. Amen? Amen. Because again, you're saved by what? By grace. Say, I'm saved. I'm saved. By, grace, by grace, not by works. Not by works. Now understand the word saved again. To be healed. Huh? To be delivered. To be set free. To be prosperous. All of that's in the word saved. So that means this. For by grace you are healed. Well, that'll get your faith going strong because it's by his favor, not by my works that I'm healed. That'll get you turned on right there. Come on now. That's right. Prosperity is by grace. Do you understand that? Prosperity of the prosperity of God is by his grace. Why? Because the scripture says, look at remembering the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become what? Rich. So notice that by grace are you prosperous. Amen. That's all part of being saved. Yes. Amen. Praise God. When God saved you, he really saved you. Amen. He didn't just save your spirit man, which is the most important part. He didn't just save the spirit man. He saved the whole man. Woo, come on, man. Praise the Lord. He saved the whole man in every area. Praise God. He saved your mind. Amen. There's so many folks tormented in their mind. And then they got born again, their spirit man on the inside, and came into some understanding of the Word of God. And their mind came, became what? Free. God wants you to live free. Did you know that? The law will bind you up. But the grace of God will make you free. Hallelujah. And it will free you to be able to, be able to believe God for anything in this life. Amen. Now, talking about contrasts between law and grace, I have some wonderful quotes here by two amazing ministers or ministries who live 150 years apart from each other. And today we're, we're experiencing around the world and in the body of Christ, I've shared this in a, other, a previous service, a great move of the Holy Spirit where preaching and teaching of grace is concerned. It truly is an outpouring of God's Spirit around the world. And so God is moving mightily in this way. But every time there's any kind of movement of the Spirit of God, you're always going to have an uprising within the church to try to quench it or they're not getting the full context of what is being communicated. And so they begin to misrepresent or even start labeling folks that God's using. Like right now, there's a label in certain ministry magazines calling this movement that I am in. And it's in me. Amen. Do you understand me? Right. It's in me and it's in you. It should be in you. Amen. But it's called hyper grace. Say hyper grace. Hyper, all them hyper grace preachers. You know what? Years ago when I was sitting under Brother Hagin's ministry and, you know, thank God, God assigned me to be under that ministry. They labeled him as that hyper faith guy. Amen. Hyper this, hyper that. So I was in the high, I was called the hyper Whatever. Call me hyperactive for Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's all right. But I'm not going to take your riddling. I'm going to take the word of God. Amen. Amen. Not opposed to things like that if someone needs it, you know, or whatever. 
But, uh, you know, I'm going to be on, 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 on God's, uh, under his influence. Amen. Amen. So now because of that, but what I found was interesting when, when all of this, um, all of these attacks began to take place against my mentor, Dad Hagen, um, the ones that were attacking him failed to realize that the message he was preaching was something that was birthed out of their own denomination. They just didn't even know their own doctrine. That's amazing, isn't it? And so uh, it turns out that over the years, many of the ones that were attacking Brother Hagin's ministry have come full circle and realized they started taking back ownership of the message because it came out of their own ministry. Hello! Well, the very same ones that are attacking some of the wonderful grace ministers that are ministering this grace or, or spearheading what the Spirit of God is doing as far as the grace teaching is concerned, some of these same people are doing the same thing today. They're attacking their message, messages, not realizing that they're, they're attacking their own message. For example, they're attacking one pastor that's preaching this, and yet the same ones that are attacking him embrace the teachings of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was one of the greatest evangelists in the past century. In the 1800s, 150 years ago, people came by the thousands to his services. People got saved by the thousands. I mean, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. This is before they had amplification. You know, sometimes 12,000 people would show up at D.L. Moody's services. And he didn't have, but he had the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, the folks, and, I, and I've been, I told you, I shared with you a little bit. Um, I read a book here a while back now um, called Destined to Rain. Has anybody ever heard of it? Destined to Rain. Joseph Prince, he's a pastor in Singapore. And I read that book, and it's on grace, man. And I'll tell you what, it stirred my heart up, my spirit up. God really just stirred me up completely in all of that. And I'm so glad for it. Well, you know, in doing a little bit of research and study and history, you know, having some understanding of the historical aspect of this message, it all goes back to Paul. Who started this hyper-grace movement? Jesus. Jesus is a hyper-grace, hyper-faith person. The Apostle Paul is a hyper-grace, hyper-faith person. Hello. And you know what? If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Hello? Come on now. They're the one who started it. it. God's the one who started that. And we're supposed to continue to preach along these lines. Now, the ones that are attacking or criticizing that pastor of New Creation Church in Singapore, Pastor Prince, the very ones that attack him love D.L. Moody. Now, I wanted to give you some contrast because both D.L. Moody and Joseph Prince both preach the Pauline revelation from Romans. So let me give you some contrast I found to be pretty interesting from a minister from 150 years ago if he was preaching today, D.L. Moody was preaching today, he would be classified as one of those hyper-grace people that are way off in left field. That I think so if he was today. It's funny how we embrace the, the ones from the old, but if somebody comes along that's really taking the exact same message and just bringing it to their generation, all of a sudden he's a, per, a heretic. What's up with that? <laughs> Double-mindedness. So here we go anyway. D.L. Moody made a statement. Um, well, actually, I'll read it. What, 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 what exactly did D.L. Moody say about the grace message 150 years ago? I'm inclined to think that he was not just a great preacher, grace preacher. D.L. Moody was a radical grace preacher. He really was. He qualified. What Moody said are in open and closed inverted columns. I have for, for, for my own reference here. I've italicized Joseph Prince's quotes the forerunner of the grace movement today. Some critics in the present day grace movement love D.L. Moody's teachings, but call Pastor Prince a heretic and a false teacher. Now, I'll give you an example. Number one, this is a D.L. Moody quote. The law shuts my mouth. And it's based, I read some scriptures we read on the law, right? And grace. He says, the law shuts my mouth, grace opens it. Isn't that wonderful, huh? The law, lock, the law locks up my heart, 
grace opens it. And then the fountain of love begins to flow out. When men get their eyes open to see the glor this glorious truth, they will cease their constant struggle. They will give up trying to work their way into the kingdom of God by the deeds of the law. And they will give themselves up for lost and take salvation as a free gift. How many of y'all know we're lost without Jesus? We need the free gift of salvation. People love him. Deal. This is Joseph Prince's quote. It's not as long, but the essence is the same. He says, sin has no power over us because we are under grace. Look at this. Grace does not give you license to sin, but freedom to do what God wants. And so they're all out there. Oh, he's preaching and giving people licenses. That's not what he says. Are you listening? Come on now. He said this, the law kills, the spirit gives life. Is that in the word? We read that in the word. What are you finding with, wrong with that? Okay, here's another wonderful quote. D.L. Moody, 150 years ago. Radical grace preacher, hello. All these guys love him, but not that prince guy. All right, so here's D.L. Moody. Life never came through the law. Did we just read that? We're all guilty before God under the law. But by grace, we're justified by faith. Amen, right? But he goes on to say, life never came through the law as someone has observed. Now, this is Moody that's going to quote somebody else 150 years ago. Here it is. When the law was given, 3,000 men lost their lives. Remember, on the day of when Moses came down off of the mountain, had the Ten Commandments, 3,000, once the law was introduced, lives were lost. All right? He says, but when grace and truth came at Pentecost, 3,000 lives were saved. What a difference or a contrast between law and grace. He goes on to say, Moody goes on to say, under the law, if a man became a drunkard, the magistrates would take him out and stone him to death. But when the prodigal son came home, grace met him and embraced him. Huh? Come on, isn't that good? Law says stone him. Grace says embrace him. Isn't that good? Law says smite him. Grace says kiss him. Law went after him and bound him. Grace said loose him and let him go. <laughs> Law tells me how crooked I am. Grace comes and makes me straight. That's D.L. Moody 150 years ago. Come on now. Is that wonderful? Okay, this is Prince now. He says this. The law kills, the spirit gives life. The power of sin is the law. He's just quoting Romans. If you want your church to sin more, preach the law. I love that's a great statement, isn't it? Why do you think I preach grace radically? If you want people to change, you have to preach grace radically. Now look at this. This sounds familiar. At Mount Sinai, when the law was given, 3,000 died. At Mount Zion, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. Too often we are on the wrong mountain. Want to go back to the mountain of Moses. What about Mount Zion? Look at what he says. This is good. God has moved mountains. In other words, he moved off of Mount Sinai and he moved on to Mount Zion. Isn't that wonderful? He has moved from Sinai where he gave the law to Mount Zion where he gave Jesus and grace. Are you getting this today? Such a contrast between law and grace. And... Uh, have you ever heard the he said, she said, said thing? Anybody ever heard that? He said and she said. She said and he said. Well, I'm going to give you something. Grace, the law says and grace says. You want a bunch of those? I'm going to give you some real quick one. Law says, grace says. Law was for a time, a 1,500-year period. But when Jesus came, that was the end of it. Don't forget it. Amen. Let me give you some he said, she said. Again, I'll quote to you from John 1, 17, where it says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? So here's some law says and grace says. Law says 
This do and thou shalt live. Grace says, live, then thou shalt do. That's good. You like that one, huh? You can write that down if you want. I'll give that to you for free. Freely given by grace. All right, the law says the wages of sin is death. Grace says the gift of God is eternal life. That's We're going to close our broadcast today by talking to you about where you will spend eternity. You know, the Bible clearly indicates that there is a heaven to gain and, and a hell to miss. You know, God is a good God. And some people say, if God is such a good God, why would he send people to hell? Well, I want you to know that God is not sending people to hell. In fact, he's trying to keep people from going to that dreadful place. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus Christ came to this earth. He came to take upon himself the penalty of every man's sin, past, present, and future. And he made a way for us to make heaven our home. And I want to extend that invitation to you today to secure heaven as your home. The Bible says that there is a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And those whose names were found in the book of life entered into heaven. And so, have you made your reservation yet? Do you have your name on the list? Well, you can't do anything in this world to earn it. It's a free gift of salvation. It's a free gift of eternal life. Jesus came and he paid the ultimate price so that you could be cleansed from your sin and so that you would never suffer the penalty of sin in this world or in the world to come. And so I invite you today to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What happens when you pray this prayer? We call it the sinner's prayer. You end up becoming born again in your spirit. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the, to the Father except through him. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. And I want to challenge you today to make this decision. Say yes to Jesus Christ and be born again. Have heaven as your home and also have a wonderful relationship with God in this life. Jesus came here to give you peace and to give you joy and to bring you back into relationship with God the Father. And so I invite you right now, pray this prayer. We call it the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation, and you will have eternal life. Say this, dear God in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I confess I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. I believe with my heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart now and make me a brand new person on the inside. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I believe you got born again. We'd love to know about it. Would you please write us or call us? Let us know what God has done in your life. We appreciate you joining our broadcast today, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next week. God bless you. And beside the river. Thank you for watching Demonstrations of Faith, a ministry outreach of Faith Alive Christian Center in Reno, Nevada. If you don't have a home church, we invite you to come and connect with us. We have ministry for the entire family on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Our Connect Youth Ministry meets on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Child care is available for all services. Our location is 120 Hubbard Way, half block east of the Pepper Mill in Reno. You can find us online at faithalive.net or by searching for Faith Alive at all social media outlets. Thanks for watching and join us next week for Demonstrations of Faith. And it's flowing to me.
mim 